Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to Bridgetown Church of Christ. We are glad that you're with us here today. Uh, my name is Eric. I'm one of the ministers here, part of the teaching team. Uh, if you've not grabbed one of these uh, Bible journals, they're in the back by the doors where you came in. Go ahead and get one. It's yours to keep, even though this is the last sermon in our Mark series for now. We're going to be picking it up again next year uh, around Lent. So definitely grab one of these. Uh, it'll help you follow along. And if you uh, haven't gotten your communion cups yet, these little things, you can go ahead and grab that while you're back there as well. The other day, I was kind of curious and asking the question, what would you see if you could see beyond the visible spectrum? You know, we can see Roy G. Biv, the, the rainbow of colors, but there's, there's other things that we can't see, like infrared and ultraviolet and uh, x-rays and microwaves and radio waves, and, and all of that lies on the same electromagnetic spectrum. And let me preface this by saying that I'm not a scientist, I'm just a competent Googler, okay? So some of the stuff that I say might not be accurate, <laughs> But it, it got me thinking, you know, one of the things I found out is that if you, if you pull sticky tape from the roll in a vacuum, it creates a little x-ray. Did you know that? I didn't know that. I, 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 but it has to be in a vacuum. So as you're, as you're wrapping your Christmas gifts this, this year, don't worry, you're not going to be exposed to x-rays uh, unless you're wrapping your gifts in space, which I thought, as I heard, as I thought about that, that would be a great origin story for a superhero, right? Like you've got a uh, mild-mannered Captain Alex Adams, that's A-T-O-M-S because it's a comic book character, okay? He's, he's an astronaut and he's on the, he's on the space station. There's a fly. <laughs> he's on the space station and he's got this gift for his fellow astronaut. It's an X-ray magnification device. Uh, but he, he can't wrap it on the space station because it's a small place. He, the, his, his coworker will see him. And so he's like, well, I'll just do this. I'll just take a space walk, and I'll wrap this gift out in space, in the vacuum of space. But as he pulls the sticky tape off of the roll, it creates a tiny X-ray. But he's wrapping an X-ray magnification device, and so he's hit by all of these X-rays, and he instantly becomes Captain Tape Man putting the earth's foes in a sticky situation, right? Uh, <laughs> but what I also found out that is that if you could see the entire electromagnetic spectrum, there would be so much light all around you that you wouldn't even really be able to see anything at all. To quote Manfred Mann or Bruce Springsteen, you would be blinded by the light, right? In fact, the, the darkest places that we can think of, like the darkness of night, the darkness of space, they would be bright with light from the electromagnetic spectrum. Where you once thought there was darkness, there would be light. And here's the thing, that light, whether we can see it or not, is there, right? We know that x-rays exist, right? We know that microwaves are there because that's how we eat our breakfast burritos, right? The light is there, we just don't see it. It's interacting with our world, but unless we have some device that can help us see what's happening, we can't see the actual x-rays and radio waves and et cetera. And so we are partially blind to reality itself. So here's, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go ahead and turn in, in your, in your uh, Bible journals there to page 66. Chapter 11 starts on that page. And on the, on the blank side of the page, you're going to draw the electromagnetic spectrum. And this will all make sense here in a minute. So you're just going to draw the electromagnetic spectrum. Beautiful, right? And then you're going to draw what we can see on the electromagnetic spectrum. So you've got those grid marks. So somewhere in the middle, just uh, draw a line on one of them, and then the next one down, draw a line there. 
This is what we see. We've got all of this light and we see this much of it. We are partially blind to the reality that lies around us. And that got me to thinking, you know, well, what if that's what truth is like? What if that's like what reality is like? There's all of this truth that lies outside what we can see. And what if there was somebody that could see all of it? That could harness the power of that electromagnetic spectrum of reality, right? Who could see all of the light we cannot see. And he would come into our world, into the world that we can see. And he would tell us things about what's out there in reality. Well, if he came and he, he told us, you know, this is, this is happening out here and this is happening out there, right? We would understand a little bit of what he was saying, but we would still have lots of questions. We would understand it in a limited way. But what if he was able to take our partial blindness away from us? What if he was able to teach us how to see truth and reality. We understand it in a limited way, but what if he was able to take our blindness away from us? We're going through a series on the book of Mark, and I don't know if you've enjoyed it as much as I have, but I've really enjoyed kind of digging in and, and working with the other uh, teachers on the team, listening to what they have to say, learning from them, they, 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 catched a, they caught a bunch of things that I missed when, when I read it. And, and so I've, I've really enjoyed doing that. Um, but one of the things when we got together as a teaching team and we were like, what are we going to do with this series? We're going to talk about Mark, but wh- how are we, we going to approach it? One of the things that we were really careful with is we wanted to approach Mark on Mark's own terms. I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but we haven't really dug into what Matthew and Luke and John say. We haven't really filled in the gaps that Mark leaves, because Mark is like a quick gospel, right? He's just, he's, ham- he's, he's running through all these stories, and it's really quick, and he, he leaves out a lot of details. But we haven't gone to Matthew and, and Luke and John to fill in those details. We kind of let those details sit the way that Mark intended them to sit. And what we saw while we were doing this is that Mark is a gospel of tension. Mark is a gospel that's full of questions. Like even if you look at Mark 16 verse 8, the earliest manuscripts that we have of Mark end right there. So the the women go to Jesus' tomb, the tomb is empty, the angel says, hey, he's not here. And then this is how, how we think the original Mark would have ended. The women fled from the tomb, trembling and bewildered, and they said nothing to anyone because they were too frightened. That doesn't sound like an answered question. It sounds like an open question. What's going to happen next? And that's all throughout Mark. He, he, he constantly is leaning into the tension And that kind of bothers us because we prefer answers, not questions. Because questions to us feel like darkness, right? Like we're groping through a a, a room that's dark, hoping that we don't stub our toe. But what we see from the electromagnetic spectrum is that even in that darkness, there's light We just can't see it. And what Mark keeps telling us is, you know, the answers that we have, like all the Jewish scribes and the Pharisees come and they give answers to Jesus' questions, but all of the answers that we have, they look like darkness, not light. In comparison to what, what Jesus is doing, they look like darkness. And I think we don't like questions because there's enough darkness in our lives as it is. Like maybe you're experiencing a lot of darkness as you walk into today. 
as we walk into the holiday season. Maybe you're feeling the weight of the world around you. Like maybe you're dealing with financial instability where where you don't have enough money to pay your bills, let alone get Christmas gifts for everybody. Maybe the geopolitical landscape is creating a lot of anxiety within you. The situation in Israel, the situation in Ukraine, the, you know, the presidential nomination thing is coming up really soon. Maybe that's causing you a lot of anxiety. Maybe you're dealing with health issues. Maybe you see the darkness within yourself. You see that you are sinful and that you've missed the mark so many times. Maybe you don't see the hope. Maybe you don't see the light. And I've got to tell you, you're not alone in that. You're not alone. The, the section that we're nearing the end of in the book of Mark is full of darkness. Jesus, three times in this section that we're in, he tells the disciples, I'm going to go and I'm going to die. I'm going to be spit on and mocked and flogged. I'm going to go and die. And each time that he does this, we see that the the disciples, they don't quite understand. They're they're, they're trying to wrap their mind around what Jesus is saying, but they can't can't wrap their mind fully around it. Like Paul was saying a couple of weeks ago, Peter has this great confession where he says, you are the Messiah. And right after that, Jesus says, okay, you, you get it. You get it partially, right? So you know I'm the Messiah, but what the Messiah has to do is go and and I have to die. And Peter's like, no. That's not what the Messiah has to do. So Peter sees partially. He sees that Jesus is the Messiah, but it's, it's like blurry. He doesn't see the whole picture. He's still kind of blind. And the second time that Jesus reveals that he's going to go and die... The, the story right after that is the disciples, they're like confused and embarrassed about what he's saying, and so they just don't even address it, and they just start talking about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom when the Messiah comes to reign, right? Who's going to be the greatest among us, right? But you know that they can see something that, that Jesus is saying is true because They're embarrassed about the fact that they're talking about who's going to be the greatest. So they see partially, but it's blurry, and they don't really know what to make of it, right? So that brings us to chapter 10, verses 32 through 34. They were now on their way up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. The disciples were filled with awe, and the people following behind were overwhelmed with fear. Taking the 12 disciples aside... Jesus once more began to describe everything that was about to happen to him. Listen, he said, we're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and teachers of the religious law. They will sentence him to die and hand him over to the Romans. They will mock him, spit on him, flog him with a whip, and kill him. But after three days, he will rise again. And this is what happens right after that. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came over and spoke to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do us a favor. What is your request? What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, when you sit on your glorious throne, like, were they just listening to what Jesus just said? They're going to kill me. When you sit on your glorious throne, we want to sit in places of honors next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. It's like they see that Jesus needs to go into Jerusalem, but they totally miss the point of what he's saying. They're missing it. And it's no wonder that they're missing it. Because Jesus is saying, this is what I'm going to do, and this will be good. I'm going to go and die, and that's good. It's, not, it's no wonder that they struggle with it. Now, 
This section where Jesus predicts his death three times is in between two stories of Jesus healing a blind man. All right? And so the first story is weird because instead of Jesus just healing the man like he usually does, he heals the man and he says, hey, can you see anything? And the man's like, ah. I see something, but it's, it's like the men are trees walking around. It's blurry. He sees partially what's happening, right? And so then Jesus fully heals the man. And then he can see just fine. And uh, this is what James R. Edwards, who's a Bible scholar, says about this particular story. He says, this story brings us to the continental continental divide of Mark's narrative. By the gradual healing of the blind man, Jesus shows how the disciples may come to faith. Like the blind man, the disciples who have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear, they can also be made to see and hear, but it won't happen on their own. They need Jesus to do it. So what we see in these stories is is the disciples... They see it, but it's part- they see it partially. It's blurry. It's like the men walking around are trees, right? It, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't quite compute what's happening for them. So that's the first story of the blind man. The second one is found in chapter 10, verse 46 through 52. Then they reached Jericho, and as Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the road. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, many of the people yelled at him. But he only shouted louder, son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, tell him to come here. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. Come on, he's calling you. Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked. That's the same question that Jesus asked James and John. My rabbi, the blind man said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go, for your faith has healed you. Instantly the man could see, and he followed Jesus down the road. What do you want me to do for you? I want to see. Have mercy on me. What we see in this passage is that Jesus has the power to heal the blind man. But more than that, he has the power to heal the blindness of the disciples. He has the power to illuminate that spectrum that we cannot see. He has the power to heal our eyes so that we can see. What do you want me to do for you? James and John are blind. They don't fully understand what Jesus is asking them, right? But Bartimaeus, he says, listen, I I can't see, right? It's almost as if his blindness gives him an insight that James and John, because they can see, don't have. So the question for us is, do we want to see? And that's a very hard question to answer because seeing means understanding what Jesus is about to do. Seeing means following Jesus as he goes to do what he's about to do. And what he's about to do is upside down. I think that following Jesus sometimes feels like darkness, like we're groping in the dark, hoping that we don't stub our toe, because this is what we see. And he's calling us to live in a world that stretches beyond that. So following Jesus, sometimes it's hard. It feels counterintuitive. It's countercultural. Sometimes it feels like we're, we're 
we're fighting against reality itself. But at the same time, following Jesus is like light. Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Following Jesus is the easiest thing. It's the most natural thing we could do. It's what we were made to do. It's living according to the truth. And so it's both of those things at the same time. We live in both of those realities because it's really just one reality. And Jesus, he's slowly exposing his disciples to the light. He's slowly exposing us to the light that that rests beyond the visible realm. He's expanding our vision so that where you once saw darkness, through Jesus you can learn to see light. And it's a process. Now what I'm not saying is this. I'm not saying that the pain and the darkness and the suffering of this world is like an illusion. Like it doesn't matter. It's real. It's a counterfeit reality that was put on us through sin. It's a counterfeit reality that we live in, but it's reality, right? So I'm not arguing that we need to adopt some elevated consciousness and put our heads in the clouds and be like, everything's okay because I've got Jesus. What Jesus shows us is everything is not okay. Because if everything was okay, he wouldn't suffer, he wouldn't die, he wouldn't be flogged. And so it's not that we need to adopt some elevated consciousness. It's that we need to realize that this is what we see And this is what's true. Mark is asking questions. Mark is leaning into the tensions, not so that we can come to the right answers. It's not about right answers, because everybody's got right answers, right? He exposes us to our darkness. He exposes us to the darkness of our understanding so that we can go to Jesus and say, have mercy on me, son of David. I want to see. Jesus, as the Messiah, he's coming and he's he's not saying, listen, I'm here to conquer Rome. I'm I'm here to, to take away the reign of the Roman authority. He's here to conquer sin and death itself. He's not here to to take out Caesar and his legions and his puppet kings. He's here to take out Satan and his legions and his puppet kings. They're not going into Jerusalem to fight a bloody battle. He's going into Jerusalem to take back his own power. It's not about conquest. It's about surrender and sacrifice. And so Jesus willingly submits himself to the cross. He sacrifices himself. He lets those evil powers envelop him in their darkest darkness. Because he knows that his light is stronger than the darkness. He knows that his life is more powerful than death. And in their effort to snuff out the light, the powers of darkness expose their greatest weakness. Because death is not enough, but it's all they had. Death is not enough, but it's all they had. And And death is now broken because Jesus didn't stay dead. He exposes himself to the darkness, and in doing that, he exposes the darkness. He exposes sin and death as that counterfeit reality, and he rips it in two. He turns the darkness of death into the light of life. And then he calls us to do the same. So let me ask you, do you see it? Do you see it? 
We say here that with Jesus, better is possible, and I think that's true. When you follow Jesus, you have access to a better life and community and purpose. But when the brothers ask Jesus about ruling in his kingdom, he calls them to follow him to the cross. So our better life and community and purpose comes with great sacrifice. It calls us to spread the seeds of the gospel like Kyle was talking about a few weeks ago. All around us, even when much of those seeds will fall on rocky soil. It calls us to be hospitable, to be receptive and confrontational, to lean in with humility and grace. But also exposing ourselves and other people to the truth of who Jesus is, to the truth and to the light. It calls us to love the unlovable, to make space for people who don't deserve the space, who didn't earn it, to make space for the fact that the light of the truth not only exposes other people, but it exposes our own imperfections. It means standing in humility and security in the face of thorns and whips and nails It means exposing death as counterfeit by taking it on ourselves. It means living in the light, reflecting the light, standing in the darkness as a witness to the light. So do you see it? What I love about the disciples is they don't see it for a very long time. They're, they're walking with Jesus for years, and still they miss it over and over again. And after Jesus walks on water, like Nick talked about a while back, they're still blind. I would, I would hope that that would convince me, right? But Jesus keeps exposing them slowly but surely. He keeps giving them opportunities, and, and eventually they come around. To see the reality of who Jesus is, it takes time. It takes constant exposure to small doses of his light. It's it's a lifelong learning process. But it's more than that, too. Because the Jewish leaders had centuries of interacting with God. They've got a history that they wrote down in the Old Testament. And many of them, when Jesus comes, instead of saying, have mercy on me, son of David, I want to see, they said, we already see everything that we need to see. And you're you're not it, right? They still miss it. We will never fully comprehend the full spectrum of his light. We'll always be blind to certain aspects of his goodness and truth and grace, which means that we just need to, to make it a habit to soak ourselves in his word, what he has revealed to us, to meditate on, meditate on it for the rest of our lives. But we also need to soak ourselves in the life of this family, the church. Because our conversations with one another, the different personalities that are here, the different talents and gifts and abilities, our different perspectives, our different experiences, they can inform us as to what lies outside of the visible realm. But only if we're willing to stick it out with each other. As long as we are willing to seek reconciliation when a relationship goes south. As long as we are willing to find ways to love one another in the midst of our deep hurt and disagreement. In fact, as we do that, we are dying to ourselves and exposing death as counterfeit to the world. And part of the problem with the church is many times we don't do that. We we look like the world in how we deal with our relationships. We don't approach them with sacrifice and humility. We approach them with pride and self-preservation, and I do this too. It's all of us, right? And in the church, we need to do better. Because we know that with Jesus, a better community is possible. Do you see it? We will never be perfect. We will never fully see beyond the visible spectrum. We will never see any of it without the help of Jesus. It's a fight to stay in the light. It is difficult to stand in the truth and be humble. 
It, it, it's difficult to recognize the grace that Jesus has lavished on us, to recognize how little we deserve what he gave us and still remain secure in the fact that he did it anyway. But what if Jesus asked you that question? What do you want me to do for you? What would you say? Would you recognize your weakness and your need for healing? Or would you ask for a throne? Now, Jesus didn't really chastise the brothers for the request. He recognizes that they don't fully understand yet what they're asking for. Because Jesus' reality is upside down. He calls us to live in an upside down system and paradigm and economy. One where the first is last and the last is first. Where you jockey for position at the end of the line, not at the front of it. One where you would give your last dime to somebody who had a pocket full of money. If it would expose them just a little bit to the light of who Jesus is. One where you would die for a person who spit in your face. One where the one who will betray you has a seat at the table. To an upside-down world where darkness is light and where death is life. And Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he was sitting next to Judas, right? He passed around the bread and the cup, and he instituted what we call communion. He told, he told us to do this to remember him. And so we do. Every week here at BCC, we drink and we eat to remember what Jesus has done for us. If you've not gotten one of these communion cups, they're in the back. You can go ahead and get one back there. But what we remember is that Jesus' sacrifice ripped a hole in the counterfeit reality that we know, the visible spectrum that we see. His death and resurrection reminds us that light has entered into the world, that death has been defeated. And so though we are not Jesus, we can participate with him in his death and resurrection. We can be released from the darkness that surrounds us and live a life of humility and sacrifice, which destroys the illusion of death's finality and power. We can live a life of security in a world of danger because we don't have anything to fear. So, as we eat the bread, let us remember how Jesus' body was given as a sacrifice. And as we drink, let us remember the blood that was poured out on our behalf. Let us remember that we can participate in the exposure of the darkness as we participate in Jesus' death. Let us remember that we are to die to ourselves and that by doing that, we can turn the world upside down by turning our lives upside down for other people. And so may you have eyes to see and ears to hear the good news of the gospel. May you spread the seeds. May you reflect on the light of reality, true reality. And may you see beyond the counterfeit reality of death and sin and help others by exposing death through sacrifice and grace and love and truth. May you live humbly. May you find your security in the truth of Jesus. And may you share that truth and grace with everyone around you. May you remember that with Jesus, better is possible. None of this is easy, but it's better question is, do you see it? Granted, none of us sees it fully. None of us sees it clearly. But with Jesus, all of us can see it better. Do you see it? 
do you want to? If you want to say to Jesus as we sing this next song, have mercy on me, son of David. I want to see you.